from Portland, Maine. This is Kimberly with Stroudwater Associates. Thank you for taking some time out of your day to join us for our webinar. Before we get started, just a couple items that are commonly asked and have already come in via chat. Um, we will be sharing the materials after the event. I will send out a link to both the materials and the recording within about 24 hours. Uh, and I just would like to do a little bit of an intro on Stroudwater Associates, the firm, as well as our speakers today. Stroudwater Associates has been around since 1985. We're a leading national healthcare consulting firm serving healthcare clients exclusively. We focus on strategic, operational, and financial areas where our perspective offers the highest value. We're proud of our track record with rural hospitals, community hospitals, healthcare systems, and large physician groups. We have offices in Atlanta, Nashville, and Portland, Maine, and we do um, we work with clients in every state. Today's speakers um, are consultants with Stroudwater. First is Louise Bride. Louise has more than 35 years of experience in healthcare management and clinical operations. At Stroudwater, she focuses on population health, strategic planning and operational improvement, and models of care, including patient-centered medical homes and team-based care initiatives. Our second presenter today is Dr. Heidi Larson. She's a senior consultant with Stroudwater. She's a family medicine physician with 25 years of clinical experience and passionate about leveraging the power of relationships to build strong primary care networks. Before joining the firm, she spent 15 years in solo practice in Portland, Maine, where she served as a liaison between independent physicians and the Maine Health Physicians Hospital Organization. To get us going today and make sure everyone is awake and your fingers are working and your brain is connecting, we're going to start with a polling question. And um, you can click in any time with um, as many as are applicable. And the question is, is your organization facing any of the following challenges? Again, check as many as are pertinent for you. Poor financial um, performance of employed practices, limited primary care access and patient panel size capacity, participation, participation in risk-bearing payment models such as Medicare Advantage or ACOs, failure to achieve quality goals or earn payer incentives, uh, and or poor patient satisfaction experience scores. See that we've got People queued right up so far. The leader is 60% poor financial performance. And now that's about tying limited uh, primary care access and patient panel size capacity. Give people a few more seconds to register their opinion. And we'll close out of this poll and we shall share the results so everyone can see. Uh, came in at 50% poor financial performance of employed practices, 64% of limited primary care access and pa patient panel size capacity, and then 30, 40, and 20% making out the um, remaining three. So with that, we will turn uh, the webinar over to Dr. Heidi Larson. Thanks, Kimberly. So why are we talking about team-based care today? I think many people on the call can relate to the fact that we're facing a critical shortage of primary care providers in this country. With aging baby boomers coming into the market and more people coming into the market in general with expansion of insurance coverage under the Affordable Care Act, we're going to require more physicians, not fewer. However, at the same time, about one third of our primary care docs are expected to retire in the next decade and fewer physicians are choosing careers in primary care out of training, opting for subspecialty care instead. Physician-led, team-based care engages all members of our staff, from our front desk to our nurses and medical assistants, providers, physicians, patients and their families, all in direct patient care. It gives us a chance as providers, physicians, nurse practitioners, and PAs, the time we need to reconnect with our patients to really sit and think 
deeply and to listen carefully and reestablish trusting relationships that may have been lost in the last few years. In addition, it allows the practice to absorb more volume, increasing opportunities to generate revenue, whether in a fee-for-service environment or in a value-based payment model, and also to provide high-quality care. We create more capacity through enhanced efficiencies. And I note that we can also increase our panel sizes, which I acknowledge was a, a concern that many of you had from our first polling question. Primary care investment is a big topic these days, especially with the recent announcement last week by CMS and CMMI around new payment models. It's been posited and shown in studies and uh, some pilot projects that doubling our investment from our current baseline from about 5 to 6%, up to 12% in primary care can yield up to a 15-fold return on investment. Two of the most frequently cited studies are that in Rhode Island, which showed that a 23% increase in primary care spending reduced total health care spending by about 18% over a period of five years. And the other study was a 2016 study of Oregon's patient-centered primary care home which showed that for every $1 increase in primary care investment, they saw $13 savings in total health care spend. Now, I'll give you their, their secret sauce right off the bat. It was around um, care management and care coordination. And the savings were mostly achieved through inpatient spend, specialty care, and emergency department utilization. Care delivery redesign through primary care investment ensures that we have the right foundation and the right infrastructure to set ourselves up for success in value-based payment models. This is Adam Bowler's quote. We probably all saw it from November of last year, talking about blowing up fee-for-service. And my goodness, did the announcement last week really resonate with those of us who were waiting? Um, CMS saying with their uh, new payment models, keep patients healthy and out of the hospital. Did you know that the primary quality measure that they'll be uh, judging our success by is acute inpatient hospitalization? That's it. Now, like you, I'm probably, we're expecting to see more quality metrics introduced into the mix, but that's it. The goal is to keep patients out of the hospital. We're gonna provide payers with pay for outcomes rather than procedures and incentivize days at home as well as, as quality of care, freeing doctors, doctors to focus on the patients in front of them and reducing regulatory and administrative burdens. The primary care first payment structure is sort of the gateway into these new value-based payment models. It involves a couple of different types of payments. The first is a risk-adjusted population payment per beneficiary per month. Now this is going to be based on HCC scores. The risk adjustment comes from the HCC scores that we document, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later in this deck. There's also a flat primary care visit fee per face-to-face -face encounter, and then a performance-based incentive payment, as I said, which is based on acute hospital, uh, hospital utilization. We're on an unsustainable path. These are hospital margins over time, and you can see over the last few years that we are definitely under assault. A lot of health systems are struggling with provider burnout, recruitment, retention, and engagement. CEOs, we know you're frustrated with practices that are inefficient and financially unsustainable and wary of subsidizing primary care practices. We want to be able to help you address these issues without alienating the medical staff. This is Stroudwater's transition framework. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through each and every box, but I want us to look at this from a 30,000-foot view. The top three rows represent delivery system transformation, and the bottom three, payment system transformation. On the left column is pure fee-for-service, and on the right, complete risk-based payment models. You can see that in the spine of this model, right front and center in the first row, that's where PCMH and team-based care models sit. So what we're talking about today truly is the foundation to be able to move towards value-based payment models. What is team-based primary care? Team-based care, by definition, involves a restructuring of clinical workflows within the constraints of established teams. 
enhancing practice efficiency and improving engagement across the entire team. Ideally, each physician is supported by two clinical assistants, and these can be medical assistants, RNs or LPNs, or mix. Using two exam rooms side by side, which we'll show you schematically later on, that maximizes workflows and helps us to become more efficient. This model is strongly supported by the American Academy of Family Physicians and the AMA, and I'll show you some of the resources at the end of the deck that actually have libraries to help you implement these models. What are the benefits of team-based care? Well, as I've alluded, it reduces the total cost of care for the organization, helps reduce our readmissions penalties, and helps us to achieve shared savings and incentive payments, whether we're in risk-based contracting with our commercial payers or Medicare Advantage, ACOs, or entering into some of these agreements that are proposed with CMS and CMMI. Reduces sources of conflict when engaging the practices around improving performance. We all know that change is hard. This is one way to help people engage around change in a way that's a little bit less hard, hopefully. It's, it represents all of us working together. It promotes long-term financial sustainability of primary care practices. Doesn't that sound good? Reducing physician turnover and burnout's a big deal. As you know, especially those of you in rural areas, costs a lot in terms of time and money and effort when a physician turns over, especially someone in primary care. We want to enhance patient engagement because that's really the key to promoting better clinical outcomes. Returning the joy to practice of medicine is really essential for all of us, and it's the fourth arm of the quadruple aim. We want to increase panel size and visit capacity, as many of you indicated in your answers to the first polling question. And of course, prepare for success in all value-based payment models. All right, thank you, Heidi. We will uh, move on to our second polling question of the webinar. Have any of your primary care practices implemented team-based care? And if they have, are the teams co-located? You can select no, we have not implemented a team-based care model. Yes, we do have a team-based care model, but the teams are not co-located. And yes, we have a team-based care model and the teams are co-located. So, so far, it looks like the vast majority do not have any version of team-based care so far. Give people a few moments to put aside their Diet Coke and their sandwich and click in. About 78% now reporting that they do not have any form of a team-based care model. And we're going to close out the poll and show you all the results. 79% do not have a team-based care model. Um, yes, 11% uh, do have a model, but it's not co-located teams. And 11% um, have team-based care and have teams that are co-located. All right. I believe we are moving on to Louise Bride for the next section. Thanks, Kimberly, and good afternoon, everyone. So now we'd like to do a little bit of a deeper dive related to the model itself. There are four core principles of team-based care, and many of you may be really familiar with and, in fact, uh, routinely think about your approach to care being team-based in terms of it being a multidisciplinary a group of individuals who work together to take care of a group of patients. In this model, there are very specific elements or characteristics of the model, and four of those are these core principles that you see here on this slide. The first principle would be co-location, which is what we were just speaking about in that last polling question, and that involves the provider and his or her core clinical team um, physically moving together and, see, and being seated or sitting together in a single workstation or float station, which is not typical in most practices today. The second core principle involves uh, implementing innovations in workflows. Again, one of the core goals of this model is to increase efficiencies. There's also a real emphasis on proactive planning, and so the second element is pre-visit planning. And that really entails 
pulling the medical records for patients for it may be for the next day. Everyone's scheduled for appointments the next day. Uh, some practices based on workflows and workload are able to do pre-visit planning a little bit farther in advance, so maybe two or three days out. But the idea is that you are taking some time up front to review those records and it's a particularly good time to look for and identify gaps in care and also to order enters into the to enter orders into the system uh, according to established protocols and standing order sets. And that would be activity that would generally be handled by the clinical staff, the assistants, rather than the physician him or herself. The third core principle involves holding a daily very brief morning huddle for the entire care team, including the front desk staff. And the goal would really be to, again, do some anticipatory planning to identify bottlenecks in the schedule for that day, um, any staffing concerns, um, folks that have to, you know, who are coming in late or leaving early, uh, cross coverage arrangements and so forth. And then also, and very importantly for the front desk staff, taking this time for a moment in the morning to identify same-day appointment slots that are available and into which the front desk staff can go ahead and schedule patients without having to come back and check each time with the uh, clinical team in the back. And then the fourth core principle involves leveraging what is called the four-stage office visit, and I will talk more about that in just a moment. Uh, that stage in particular really gets at some of the core components of the team-based care model that are really differentiators from other clinical models that you may be accustomed to. And in this four-stage office visit component in particular, again, the emphasis is on maximizing efficiencies of the team. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Kimberly, for our third polling question. All right. Um, number three, do your medical assistants or nurses remain in the exam room during the provider visit to document in real time? Um, please select one. You can say yes, always, yes, most of the time, yes, occasionally, and no, never. Wait for people to give their opinion. Um, again, it's the, do your MAs or nurses remain in the exam room during the provider visit to document in real time? We don't have anyone who does it unanimously. Um, about 17 or 18 percent are saying most of the time, and almost half are saying never so far. So let's give people just another couple of seconds. To vote. Looks like we've got most everybody has voted now, so we will close and share these results. So, um, no one represented on this phone call always has MAs or nurses in the exam room to document. 17% uh, do it most of the time, 35% occasionally, and almost 50% never do it. Back to you, Louise. Okay, thanks. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the role of the medical assistant and the nurses in, who are in the core clinical team in the context of this team-based care model. Many of you may be familiar with or, in fact, utilize, in your, utilize within your organization's medical scribes. However, in this model, we are not really talking about the traditional medical scribe role. Um, and in fact, the, in, in the traditional model, those individuals may be located remotely during the time that they're performing their work. In the context of the team-based care model, it is really more accurate to think in terms of a co-visit. And I'll say more about that in just a moment, but in that co-visit, really the nurses or the medical assistants who are working with the physician, working with the provider, have a bit of an expanded role and are involved in managing preventive care, updating chronic illness management, uh, information in the medical record, and so forth. So that's really where the co-visit component comes in and becomes important. One of, the, one of the outcomes of that aspect of this model is that, uh, and we have heard this 
feedback firsthand as we have worked with teams who have implemented the model and, and others have experienced this as well, and that it is this model really provides an opportunity for the medical assistants or for the nurses to broaden their own knowledge and to listen and learn in real time as the physician or provider is in the exam room discussing their findings, which is a real um, uh, job satisfier for the clinical staff. This next slide, we will take a look at the, um, let's see if I can get this to advance. Um, the next slide is a summary of the four-stage office visit. And as you may remember, this is, again, one of the four core principles of the team-based care model. And as you'll see as I go through each of the stages, this really represents or demonstrates concrete ways in which the work is redistributed across the team. Again, going back to that definition of the team-based care model that Heidi shared earlier in the presentation. Um, redistribution of the work and more fully engaging and involving all the members of the team are, are core concepts of this model. And you'll see that um, as, as uh, you'll see that demonstrated as we go through the four stages. Okay, so office visit stage one. And this occurs during what is typically thought of as the patient rooming process. So the, the patient rooming process would proceed as, as usual, but with some expanded activities performed, again, by the medical assistant or the nurse who is assisting that provider for that, for that schedule that, for that day. Um, so expanded information gathering would involve potentially the medical assistant or the nurse taking the time to review and update the medical, surgical, family histories uh, with the patient. Uh, it's also a great time to, to discuss with the patient gaps in care that have been identified during that pre-visit planning period that we spoke about a moment ago. Now is the time really when you have the patient there in the, in the exam room to have that conversation and to reinforce, to provide some education if necessary and to reinforce the importance of that patient receiving uh, preventive care or addressing their chronic disease and, is, and uh, receiving the necessary services. And then for the, the clinical assistant to proceed with actually ordering those things as necessary, again, utilizing established protocols and standing orders so that all that can take place during this first stage of the office visit. In stage two, really stages two and three um, are, are occurring uh, one flowing really into the next, one stage flowing into the next, because at stage two is the point at which the physician or the provider enters the room. Unlike the typical experience, and it was borne out uh, among, among all of you all participating today, typically at this point, physician or provider comes in, the medical assistant or the nurse leave, leaves the exam room. In this model, the medical assistant or the nurse remains in the exam room, is seated at the computer, and is then providing documentation or performing documentation in the electronic health record in real time while the physician or provider is examining and speaking with the patient. So this is really where that co-visit that I spoke about a moment ago, this is where and when the co-visit takes place. And it is a key differentiator for this model one of the huge benefits of this, of this component of the model is that it frees up the physician or the provider to focus directly on the patient and not on the computer. And I know I personally have had the experience where I'll go to see a physician and the entire time that I'm in the exam room with the physician, he or she is facing the computer and glancing at me occasionally, and I suspect many of you have had that, that same experience. So that really is, that dynamic really changes in the context of this model. The third stage is really a continuation then. Uh, at that point that the physician or, pro, or the uh, provider is formulating their, their diagnoses and, and then involved in discussion with the patient around the, the treatment plan and the, and the orders. And 
during that period of time, the medical assistant or the nurse has remained in the room and continues to do real-time documentation. It's a, we, we find and we, we observe and others have uh, demonstrated as well that again, one of the real benefits of this model is that by utilizing that clinical assistant to perform real-time clinical doc documentation, there is increased completeness and accuracy of the documentation. We have had physicians uh, report that directly to us as they have uh, been involved in implementing this model. And it also provides an opportunity for that assistant to update the patient's problem list where that is indicated and to document or update the HCC scores, which are really important in terms of capturing and documenting the level of complexity of those patients it becomes increasingly important in, a, in an value-based reimbursement environment, as, as Heidi has mentioned. Again, this is the time when that intentionally can be, um, can be accomplished. And moving on to stage four, uh, at this point, the physician or the provider is uh, ready to leave the exam room, exits the exam room which then gives that provider an opportunity to uh, reflect for a moment, to review and sign the documentation, review the orders, and ensure that they have formulated um, a treatment plan that, that they think is what will be appropriate for that patient at that point in time. While the provider is outside the exam room doing, doing that work, the clinical assistant has remained in the room with the patient to complete the patient's office visit. And uh, that's the opportunity then for the assistant to spend a moment reviewing the orders that the physician has, uh, has given or to review instructions, changes in the treatment plan, um, what have you. Um, that is the time then to, for the assistant to review all that with the patient. At that time, then the patient would move on either to their next stop in the, um, in the, within the practice or would be prepared to leave and the um, provider moves on to the next patient who is ready. Uh, the, the second clinical assistant has really started the cycle all over again by performing stage one and having the next patient ready. And the clinical assistant is, who is leaving the exam room from this patient is ready to move on to their next patient or to use that time to um, check messages and, and what have you. So it becomes then a continuously repeating process. And with that, I think we are ready for our fourth and final polling question. So I will give it back to you, Kimberly. All right, Louise, uh, let me put this out live. Um, are your primary care practices experiencing any capacity or appointment access challenges? No, no access problems at all. Yes, a few access problems, moderate access problems, or significant access problems. Uh, let's see how we're tracking so far. Um, the lowest seems to be about six or seven percent saying they don't have any access problems. About 47 percent right now say they have moderate access problems. And a concerning amount at 16 percent say significant access problems right now. We'll give people a couple more seconds to put in their vote and then we will tabulate and share with everyone. Closing out of this and sharing the results. Uh, so we've got uh, the bullseye at 53% is yes, moderate access problems um, with a surprising 7% saying or 16% saying significant access problems. With that, we go back to Heidi Larson. Thanks, Kimberly. Now I wanna share with you a schematic overview that kind of shows you in a different way what, this, what uh, Louise has just presented to you. This is from real patient data, incidentally. We like to do uh, a baseline assessment of your practice's financial, operational, and quality performance data before we start. So with this practice, we were looking specifically at visit capacity and productivity. Where it says current model was where their current appointments were set up every 30 minutes. And you notice eight spots available every 
session, so eight in the morning, eight in the afternoon, the average fill rate was 5.6. So 5.6 out of the eight were filled on average per half day session. If you move over with me to the next column under proposed model, that's how we set it up in their team-based care implementation. Two rooms, side by side, two clinical assistants, physician going back and forth between the two rooms. So if you look at the capacity, what does that do? So look at the total visits available on the bottom is 16, increasing to 26. So what we did, we didn't add that second column completely the first day, of course. We added a couple of appointments. So we increased our potential spots from 16 to about 21. As people got more comfortable, though, they filled this in completely, increasing the capacity to the full 26, which is actually a 63% increase in visit capacity. So for those of you who indicated issues or concerns with patient access, this should go a long way towards helping solve that, or at least to address it. I wanted to call out also that as the physician is moving from one room to the next, he or she is completing the documentation and, and signing off on the notes at the end of each visit before moving on to the next room. Just to recap, the benefits of the team-based care model, significant increases in productivity because we have changes in workflow and it makes us more efficient as a team. This supports long-term financial sustainability no matter what model you're in through visit volume if you're in a fee-for-service environment or to visit capacity and panel size if you're in more of a risk-based environment. Optimize provider patient time. I, that, as a family doc, I can tell you, that's right at the heart of what we're doing here. Being able to sit with a patient, to pull the stool over to the exam table, and to look at the patient in the eye, knee to knee, and actually talk with the patient and not look at the computer screen is like gold. It's really, it's, it's very, very, very valuable time. I found that with my patients, I was able to get a couple of extra minutes with each patient to look at pictures of, of grandkids at recent birthday parties, for example, or talk about new puppies, but do something that helps me to connect uh, with the patient as a person outside of what we were talking about for their office visit that day. Also, we see reduced opportunity costs. If patients get, can't get in to see us, they might need to go somewhere else, and they might go to the local emergency department or urgent care, which, if you're in a risk-based payment environment, is a problem. We see reductions in clinical variation through the use of standardized protocols. There's a reference that I'll share with you at the end of a study done by Dr. Hopkins. He shares his data in his article from pre-implementation through post-implementation. And he actually showed an 8.5% reduction in direct costs, which he attributed directly to clinical variation reduction through the use of standardized protocols. This model in team-based care ensures that we have the infrastructure to deliver better care, to do a better job of taking care of the health and well-being of an entire population or panel of patients. We do this through increased attention to prevention, as Louise mentioned, and, and preventive care services, and also focusing on chronic disease management. If you come in for a cough, but you have diabetes and you haven't had your A1C checked in the last six months, it's gonna get ordered. This leads to better clinical outcomes and better patient engagement. Increased collaboration, as we said, hopefully helps us to move a little bit towards restoring the joy to the practice of medicine. The quadruple aim, improve quality, enhance patient experience, reduce total cost of care, and renew joy in practice, right? That's what this is about. And again, I can't emphasize enough, this establishes that critical foundation for success as we move towards value-based payment models. When Louise and I do an implementation with a team, you have a clinician-led team. I'm a family physician, family doc at heart. I've been in practice for over 25 years. Louise has a nursing background and she's a clinical operations expert. When we are lucky enough to go out into practices, we sit side by side and work elbow to elbow with teams in their flow stations through the day. Now that's not always fun, especially the first day of an implementation. Sometimes it's really kind of tough, but we empower the team through the process to make changes on the spot. We use lean principles, lean design principles. Anyone know about the and on cord? Anyone can pull the and on cord to stop the process at any time, right? 
If someone's frustrated with the way the flow station is laid out, we stop. We move things around, and then we keep going. It becomes an iterative process that we're handing off to the team to own. So this is a refined, hands-on coaching process in very close collaboration. collaboration. We want to customize the model to work for the team. This is a scalable model. We include representatives from IT, education, quality, and administration in our implementation so that they see what exactly we're doing as we're building this process out, and they can scale this model across the organization. I want to point out that the medical assistants and the clinical assistants in general become the team-based care champions, and they're the ones who really help roll it out to future practices. We want to share some early results with you. An internal medicine practice in the Northeast saw improved rates of preventive care services, increased visit capacity, and enhanced care management activities within the first six months. Let me tell you first about their PHQ-9 screening problem. They had a rate of 2% for PHQ-9 screening for depression, and they were in an ACO, so this, this was a problem for them. And they knew that they were doing the depression screening. And they knew that they were checking the boxes in their EHR. But what it took was sitting down on the first day of implementation with IT present to see which boxes we were clicking. And you know what? They were actually entering this data into 10 different places in their EHR, but only one of them counted for the quality metric. So if they missed that one spot, as they often did, apparently, with a baseline of 2%, it wasn't counting. So what we did was we moved the process out to the front desk. We decided that this was really a non-clinical task, and we asked the front desk to take it on. They implemented universal PHQ-9 screening for all our patients who were coming in, and they recorded it in the single spot where it counted, and the team could then see the results at the time of the visit. They increased their screening from a baseline of 2%, to 40% in just three months. This team leveraged their pre-visit planning and their morning huddle process to increase their patient same-day visit access. They had a real concern about patient access when we started, and they were able to increase their visit volume from 90% of capacity to 124% in just six months. They did this, as I mentioned, by adding just one to two patients per half-day session to start so that it was manageable for the team. One of their biggest home runs, I think, was incorporating their RN care manager into their core team at their flow station. She was in the same building, but not anywhere where she could be in direct communication with the team. So she came in and attended our pre-visit planning session, and she created a system for flagging patients in the HR with whom she had had telephone contact, but with whom she wanted to meet in person. So she was able to come into the exam room at the end of the physician visit and meet personally with patients who required some extra support, strengthening her own rapport and developing her own personal relationships with our complex patients. I want to tell you about one patient in particular. She was probably in her 70s or 80s. She was a retired nurse on four liters of oxygen and a medication list as long as your arm for chronic COPD, and she was grouchy. She was just really grouchy. She was frustrated. She was going to the emergency department several times a month for exacerbations and still just not quite where she wanted to be. This nurse care manager met with her and gave her her card. It was so simple, but she gave her her direct line and asked her to call her next time she had an exacerbation, inviting her to reach out to the team to problem solve with her directly instead of having to go through the ED. And the patient left with a smile on her face, I might add. Another interesting story out of Nebraska. We were there on site for an implementation, and I was told by the CEO, please don't talk to the front desk. Don't look at them. Last year, they were all ready to quit, and we worked through their whole process. We revamped everything, and now they're happy. So please, please don't disrupt that. I said, well, okay. So back we went to the flow station, and, and it, as is typical, the first day is a little bit a little stressful, Everybody's getting used to the, the changes that are involved, which are myriad. And at the end of the day, we were kind of laughing and joking, relaxing, talking together, and doing our pre-visit planning. 
And guess who wanders back to the flow station? You got it, the front desk person. Well, she's curious, right? She hears what we're doing back there. She wants to be part of it. She wants to help. So in of her own, uh, she, on her own, she decided to reach out to patients who were due for diabetic eye exams. She looked at the schedule and went two weeks ahead to all the patients who were scheduled for diabetes follow-up. She called them and asked them if they'd had their diabetic eye exams. And if they weren't, if they'd had their exams but they weren't in our record, she called the docs and got the reports and put them in the record, attaching them as a patient's chart. If they hadn't had their diabetic exams, she helped them to schedule them so we had the result by the time of the visit. One person at the front desk increased our rates of documented screening for retinopathy from 21% to 42% in just 30 days. Another dramatic result, I think this group actually doubled their rate of tetanus vaccination. This was a practice in the Southeast. They had a simple change in their workflow and within 30 days, they significantly increased their rates of vaccination for tetanus. We were able to incorporate advanced care planning into the rooming process. We use tools that are already available within an organization like conversation starter kits, hello kits, or five wishes. You might be familiar with those and with others. A lot of organizations are developing palliative care service lines for the inpatient units. However, they haven't coordinated yet often with the, um, with the practices. So what we did was standardized the tools that we were using with patients across the system so the patient saw the same thing no matter which setting they were in and incorporated that into the first stage of the office visit so that patients and their families knew that we were available to talk about their wishes um, at the time of the visit. We also started weekly team meetings. I'm a big fan of weekly team meetings. I used to love to meet with my team. We did it uh, midweek, usually around lunchtime. And I would start with a question the night before. As we were leaving, I would ask my team a single question and I would think about it all week and so would they. One of my favorites was, uh, tell me, what is the rock in your shoe? And my team would just giggle, I have to tell you. And they'd all run off and we'd think about it. And then the next day at lunch, I'd ask the question again and then just sit back and listen. Let the team talk through it. Talk about what's going on, what processes need to be tweaked, what we want to try to do differently, what we want to adapt and change. We want to stay nimble in our approach, right? We want to be uh, able to make changes. And if they don't work, we embrace our mistakes, we learn from them, and we try something new, and we talk about it next week. It's also a great opportunity to learn more about each person's special skills and interests, people's talents and passions, so we can leverage those in, our, in the course of our work. And we learned that we don't all have to be experts in everything and that there's a value in collective intelligence. When we're doing this implementation, we think it's really important to check in with patients regularly. We tell them up front that we're trying something a little bit new. We ask for their patience with us. And then we ask them on their way out how the visit went. So these are quotes from real patients during our implementation process. One patient said, I really liked it. It was more personal. Another, I felt more taken care of. Another said, I really loved having all the focus on me. Another one said of the medical assistant, if I don't hear everything the doctor says, I can call back and ask you about it. And another one said, it's like a family environment. Something we noticed too that was interesting was that more patients were requesting access to the patient portal when they were checking out from their office visit after experiencing this, this uh, new model, this team-based care model in their visit. Talking with providers and staff, the nurses felt empowered, as well they should. They said, I feel more directly involved in patient care. I'm actually using my nursing skills. They felt more valued. One in the South said, y'all are listening to us now. That's a big deal. One front desk staff member said, I love the huddle. It works. She was brand new to her position, and here we came in and turned their whole model on its ear. And she embraced it with a big smile every day. She, was, she really hung in there. But having those spots opened to her 
in the course of the morning huddle, spots where she could just give them straight to patients who called and wanted to be seen, empowered her and made her really feel part of the process and she felt really good about it. One physician commented that she used to finish her documentation in her pajamas after her kids went to bed. We talk about that as pajama time, right? But she said that this model had changed her life. Another physician used to take vacation days to catch up on paperwork but still couldn't complete everything. We're seeing high rates of depression and burnout. There's a reason for that, but there are also fixes. This is one of those fixes. I mentioned these resources. We changed it from references to resources at the suggestion of a client, actually. And I really want to make sure that, that you understand the wealth of information that's in this list. If you look at the third bullet, the AMA Steps Forward Guide to Implementing Team-Based Care, that's an entire library that you can look at with lots of different ideas and small steps that you can take towards implementing a team-based model of care. The article I referred to with before and after data is the fourth one by Dr. Hopkins. And take a look at some of the other references too. They're all really rich resources for you to use as you think about moving to a new model. Back to Kimberly. All right, thank you, Dr. Larson. Um, we had a few questions come in over the course of the webinar via chat. Uh, the first one I'd like to put out there is how long does it take to implement uh, this version of team-based care? Heidi, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure, I'll take that. Um, as I mentioned, we begin with a baseline assessment of your practice's financial operational and quality performance data, and then we present it to the entire group, including administration, IT, education, uh, quality members, like as I said before, we, in the form of a kickoff day, and we use that kickoff day also as a training session so people have time to play around in the EHR to make sure that the windows that I'm seeing match the windows that my assistant is seeing, it's pretty important, right? So we're literally on the same page. So that's one day, and then there's two days for a phase one implementation in which we really get down the nuts and bolts of that, the four core principles of team-based care, co-location, pre-visit planning, the daily huddle, and the four-stage office visit. Then we come back about a month later and help you, what I call put gas in the car, implementing things like advanced care planning, pain management and opioid management, MAT if you have it, those sorts of processes that all can be leveraged very powerfully in a team-based model of care. Did I answer that okay? Kimberly, pretty comprehensive. I tried. For the non-clinical person in the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have another question. Um, it seems like there's some commonality and overlap with uh, patient-centered medical home and team-based care. Um, can you help this attendee understand the differences? Who would that be best for? Louise? I'll, I'll, um, I'll take that one. Thanks, Kimberly. Okay. Uh, so, so yes, that's a great question. And I think um, many of you may be familiar with the patient-centered medical home model of care. And so then the question really is, what? how is that different? How is that model different from team-based care? Uh, I think it's really important for me to say first that there are some really, um, there are several major common elements between the two models. Both really focus on the patient at the center of care delivery. Uh, hopefully you have heard that from us today in the context of team-based care. And that's obviously also clearly a, a major element of the patient-centered medical home utilizing the full team, having everyone work at the top of their license or the top of their qualifications, the, that would be a common element. The daily huddle is another common element. And very importantly, both focus on pro the practices performing and providing comprehensive uh, proactive care and care coordination for their patients. There are also a couple of really key differences between the two models, and, and we've really tried to focus on those in our presentation today in terms of um, how the team-based care model is different. Co-location is one of those, and there are many of you in the audience today, you may actually be already doing the patient-centered medical home 
Um, and some of these elements have, may have sounded familiar to you, but you've also indicated to us that uh, by and large, you're not doing the co-location. Um, and so that is a core principle of team-based care. We, we believe and we observe and experience that that really is a way to increase coordination and collaboration among the team members and to have that real-time interaction with the physicians or providers. That's not typically the case in the PCMH model. The other key difference that we've talked about today is that this model, the team-based care model, really does focus more specifically on the redistribution of work across the members of the team and, and, on, and on increasing workflow efficiencies within the practice. Uh, again, that's not really called out and not an area of emphasis in the PCMH model. Um, and then and in particular, and again, this has really been borne out by the polling results today, that that idea of the that that uh, concept of the co-visit with the medical assistant or the nurse, cons you know, routinely staying in the exam room and documenting in real time, that is a foundational element of the team-based care model and is not um, a focus of the PCMH model one way or the other. I will say that we do believe that the, that the two models are very complementary and can be combined. So if you have a practice or you have practices in your organization that have already implemented PCMH, that does not preclude you from now adding in the team-based care model. It is a way to really have added value of the by combining and integrating the models. And as we, I think, have already mentioned, both Heidi and I have experience working with both models, and we would be happy to discuss that scenario with any of you um, further offline if, if that would be of interest or of help to you. Thank you, Louise. Um, looks like we have one last question to bring us to the close of the webinar today. Um, change is, is difficult. Humans are wired to resist change. Um, since you're embedded with these practices and you see it right firsthand, what are the biggest challenges in, in making the change to team-based care? Heidi, do you want to you want to take that away? You want to kick that off? Uh, sure, sure. Um, change is hard. This is a lot. A lot of this is about change management. Um, I think staffing has, has been a concern of some organizations that we've worked with. This model is designed to leverage everyone who's in your team without having to add people. As I said, it's a, it's a change in workflow within the constraints of an established team. Some, however, have found that they do require more medical assistance and medical assistants who are prepared a little bit differently. One of our clients calls this the enhanced MA model. Um, so that's one piece. And I think the other piece is really working with IT and having that training in the electronic record to be able to move in a facile way from one screen to another in the course of the office visit while we're in the room with the patient. So that's a little bit of a barrier too because that takes time. All right. I think uh, Heidi and, uh, and Kimberly, one other thought that to add to to that answer, we've we've uh, both Heidi and I have mentioned this as we have gone through the presentation uh, several times. We've made reference to the medical assistants, the nurses, uh, performing functions, performing activities in accordance with established protocols or or standing orders. And so, if a practice hasn't historically done that, hasn't had those kinds of of tools in place, then that would be another important um, uh, set of activities to do to really maximize the value and the benefit of this model. So I would say as another part of the, of the change process, that would be another that would be another area of focus if that's not something that a practice has already done. All right, thank you, Louise. Thank you, Dr. Larson.
Um, we will close out. As promised, um, I will send you um, an email with a recording and a link to the presentation materials. I'm also going to include a link. We um, have a new podcast here at Stroudwater called Findings from the Field. And um, Dr. Larson was interviewed, I guess, maybe a two months back um, and did about 15, 20 minutes on team-based care in that format, and I'll send a link to that as well. Um, you can reach out to us uh, at any time. Uh, Louise and Heidi's information is here for you. And we thank you so much for spending part of your day with us.